Well, hello all. I want to uh, do a video today about understanding the South, understanding the American South. Uh, a lot of people are asking me questions uh, through social media, through handwritten letters uh, sent here to Kentucky, uh, through private messaging. And uh, there's a massive amount of interest in the American South right now. Probably more people are interested in understanding the South than in my entire lifetime anyway. But what I want to do is start off uh, answering those questions with uh, a reading list. Now, the reading list is vast. I'm just going to talk to you about five books uh, today. But there's been more written about the American South than any other region in the country. As a matter of fact, I would argue that if it were not for the South, there would be no America. The South's two great contributions to the world are its music and its literature. And they are contributions because they come from a lived experience. And um, I'll go ahead and tell you that I, I fundamentally disagree with the majority of historians who have written about the South who think that race is the central theme of Southern history. I don't think that for one second. Um, I think that the central theme of Southern history, uh, the far more important theme, is the, the South's persistent uh, desire to preserve an agricultural and rural civilization. Uh, even in the days when it was uh, attempting to preserve slavery, uh, the, the the attempt to preserve slavery was not so that we could uh, develop a, an industrialized civilization. The attempt to preserve slavery was part uh, of a larger uh, attempt on behalf of the South to defend an agricultural civilization. Now, I'm not defending slavery. I'm simply saying that um, you can't place the historical uh, defense of, of slavery uh, in any other context. The only context that it makes sense is, is within the context of the South fundamentally desiring to maintain and preserve an agricultural civilization in a world that was becoming increasingly modern, progressive. Uh, people uh, were not making a living on the land uh, nearly as much uh, and in more industrialized parts of the American North during the 19th century. Uh, so I think that we see the, the Southern tradition uh, as being one primarily of agrarianism. And so the, the readings that I'm going to provide to you uh, come from that perspective, and, and they uh, promote uh, an interpretation of the South as, as being fundamentally an agricultural society from the, from, from the beginning, from its inception, from colonization and settlement. And even today, I think that most Southerners have this need, this desire to be connected to the land in some way, regardless as to whether you enjoy hunting or fishing, or whether you're a farmer, whether you have memories of your parents or even grandparents, sometimes great-grandparents in their farm. So let's just get right into it. I'll talk more about all that uh, as we move along, but I don't, want this, I don't want this to be an extensive video. I just want to mention some books to you. Uh, if you want to read them, you can. I'll put some links down below. Uh, this video that will show you where you can get them. And some of these, one or two may not be readily available, I don't know. But let's start with the first one, uh, The Southern Tradition, uh, authored by Eugene Genovese. Now, Eugene Genovese, this book is, it came out in the mid-90s. Uh, Eugene Genovese was a Marxist for a considerable amount of time. And he converted to the Catholic Church uh, uh, later on in life, and his wife also converted to the Catholic Church uh, sometime after he did. And so they, uh, it, Genovese, is, I think, taught in Georgia for a considerable amount of time, and it's my understanding that he did not drive a car. His wife drove him everywhere he went. And, uh, I never met the man personally, but I did know several people who knew him personally, and I admire his work. So the title is The Southern Tradition, The Achievement and Limitations of an American Conservatism. Now, I'll just say right now, I, I, the South is fundamentally, primarily, a conservative-oriented society. Even today, uh, except for pockets of, of urban life and, and city life, 
the South is overwhelmingly conservative in its ec- economics, in its politics, in its religion across the board. But it's not the same. Uh, <laughs> Southern conservatism is not the same as what you might call Republican Party conservatism today. Uh, they, they are not one and the same. As uh, Mel Bradford, a uh, wonderful Southern writer, used to say, you can, be, you can call yourself a Southerner and you can call yourself a conservative, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a Southern conservative. So the preface to the book uh, begins with a quote by Richard Weaver. And Richard Weaver is a man we will talk about probably in a later video. But the quote is this, the South is the region that history has happened to. And Genovese readily admits that he's a native New Yorker in this preface. He's not from the South. He's looking at the South as an outsider, and he admits that. And listen to this. Uh, I'll just read a couple of lines from his preface. The, the Northern victory in 1865 silenced a discreetly Southern interpretation of American history and national identity, and it promoted a contemptuous dismissal of all things Southern as nasty, racist, immoral, and intellectually inferior. We are still dealing with that problem right now. Uh, the, the South is so misunderstood, uh, the, the, and, and this was in the mid-1990s when he wrote this. It's far worse now. The Northern victory did carry out a much too belated abolition of slavery, and he's right about that. Um, but we'll probably get into some more literature about the institution of slavery a little bit later on. But uh, the historical fact is that the South, it just as a side note, uh, was trying to come up with a plan for e- eventual uh, gradual emancipation of, of the slaves. Uh, but the, the South was put on the defensive in the middle of the 19th century, and the attempts on behalf of the South to eventually eradic- eradicate this on their own uh, was certainly put on the back burner. The Northern victory, okay, so that's what, what we're talking about. But it also sanctified Northern institutions and intentions, uh, which included the unfettered expansion of a bourgeois worldview and the suppression of alternate visions of social order. In consequence, from that day to this, uh, the Southern conservative critique of modern Gnosticism has been wrongly equated with racism and white supremacy. Rarely these days, even on Southern campuses, is it possible to acknowledge the achievements of the white people of the South. And that's still the way it is now. Uh, The 1619 Project is trying to erode uh, the history of settlement and colonization which included a great many Europeans, uh, not simply Africans, during the 17th and 18th century. So, I still think that I'm not going to read any more from this. I got a couple of other books I want to talk about. But the Southern tradition, Eugene Genovese, it is worth your time, and I think it might still be readily available today. All right, the next book, John Grammer, Pastoral and Politics in the Old South. Uh, this is a book about five gentlemen, John Taylor, John Randolph, Nathan Beverly Tucker, George Fitzhugh, and Joseph Glover Baldwin. All of these are antebellum, uh, antebellum Southern politicians and writers. And the, what this book achieves is, is, is essentially it explains the recognition uh, of many Southerners during the antebellum period that the South was, was fundamentally different in its vision of the American future. Uh, what the South envisioned uh, American society looking like in the coming decades and coming generations. And uh, let's see if there's one or two things I want to mention in here. All right. The, so here we, this, I'm just picking one or two, one or two paragraphs. Few readers nowadays, and this is also a book that came from the mid-1990s. Few readers nowadays will be surprised to hear that the South is as much a concept as it is a place, and that the process of constructing the idea of the South was essentially a literary one. Like America itself, the South was written into existence, first by the pamphleteers of the Virginia Company, who promised economic opportunity and easy living to Englishmen who could be induced to leave their native land, and later by American statesmen on whom it slowly dawned that the, that the tobacco-growing and slave-holding section of the country had developed its own set of political and ac- economic interests. Uh, the Confederacy, he quotes Karl Marx here, and Karl Marx was not right about most everything, but a stop clock is, is, is uh, right twice a day. <laughs> the Confederacy, said Karl Marx, was not a nation but a battle cry. 
And so this book is extremely important if you want to understand our Southern intellectual history, how, how Southerners were thinking about themselves and identifying themselves with their homeland uh, during the decades immediately, immediately prior to the Civil War. So that's another book that you might look into. It's wonderful. Now, a primary source that I, I think is invaluable is um, Jefferson Davis's memoirs. Jefferson Davis, The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government. Now, this was published originally in the 1880s, and I, can, I don't think there is a, a better description of what at least the Confederate Government thought that they were doing by seceding from the Union and create, creating a separate government for the, the seceded states. And so this is uh, the preface, and this is uh, President Davis. The object of this work has been, from historical data, to show that the southern states had rightfully the power to withdraw from a Union into which they had, as sovereign communities, voluntarily entered that the denial of that right was a violation of the letter and spirit of the compact between the states, and that the war waged by the federal government against the seceding states was in disregard of the limitations of the Constitution and destructive of the principles of the Declaration of Independence. So the preface doesn't mention a thing about slavery, uh, not in this first paragraph. Actually, Davis goes on later in this book to say that the institution of slavery, the, the debates about slavery was simply the... Uh, finger that pulled the trigger on a musket that had been capped and loaded for quite some time before that. There was a large uh, understanding among Northerners and Southerners prior to the Civil War that the two regions were distinctly different. And uh, Shelby Flint once said that uh, the, the, the Civil War was a conflict between two different forms of civilization, and I think that is still very much the truth. A, a great perver perversion of truth has been the arraignment of the men who participated in the formation of the Confederacy and who bore arms in its defense as the instigators of a controversy leading to disunion. Sectional issues appear conspicuously in the debates of the convention which framed the federal constitution and its many compromises were designed to secure an equilibrium between the sections and to preserve the interests as well as the liberties of the several states. And he rightly points out, Davis does, African servitude at that time was not confined to a section, but was numerically greater in the South than in the North, with a tendency to its continuance in the former and cessation in the latter. Uh, slavery existed in most all states at the time that the Constitutional Convention was ratified, well, drafted in 1787. And so uh, this, this, D Davis, Davis is, has received a great deal of chastisement from modern society. Here in the state of Kentucky, they removed his monument from the uh, state capitol of uh, 2015, 2016, somewhere along in there. I remember watching it on television. At that time, we were still living in South Carolina. And I remember watching them remove Davis's statue. It, <laughs> all those uh, little people looked like <laughs> minions and servants of the of the national state. Now, number four, "Still Rebels, Still Yankees" by Donald Davidson. Whoop, about lost my pipe. <laughs> Steel Rebels, Steel Yankees by Donald Davidson. Donald Davidson was from Middle Tennessee. He taught literature at Vanderbilt University until the 1960s. He was an instrumental figure in the Southern Agrarian Movement in uh, the 1920s and 30s. So most, most of these essays come from the early to mid 20th century. And so uh, I think they are extremely important. And just a couple of lines from, from this introduction here. I can't smoke that thing and, and, and do all this at the same time. A little bit difficult. <clears throat> this introduction is written by Lewis Simpson and who was also a, a wonderful Southern writer and scholar in, in his own right. 
And so um, this, is, this is a couple of lines here. Reality is measured by the pure possibility of what man may become, not by what he uh, is from long experience. Against this disastrous modern loss of experience, Davidson wanted to establish the poetry uh, lying below all levels of rationality, that is, the permanence of man. And so this book is not primarily about the Civil War. It's about the long view of the South, uh, the philosophical underpinnings of what makes the South the South. And it's all rooted in the soil. It's all rooted in, in agrarianism. And Davidson explains that in this book very, very well. Um... <laughs> so he, he's talking about the purpose of the book and so forth, and he says the professional, this is Davidson, the professional world of education now committed to anti-humanism and firmly indentured to the service of science is not interested. So he's right. The, the, probably this book did not receive, these essays did not receive a large audience at the time they were written because um, they, they, it's not always been the, the South. <laughs> I can't think of a time when the, the South has ever been mainstream America. Except, except for the first few decades after the ratification of the Constitution. The first four or five presidents uh, were all from Virginia, and Virginia is firmly in the South. It has often been called the Queen of the South, although I think South Carolina can at times claim something similar. Uh, but, but read Donald Davidson if you can find any of his works. He's just phenomenal. He was uh, one of the great thinkers uh, in, in the South in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, the final book I want to talk about for this video is Cracker Culture by Grady McQuinney. Now this was a controversial book when it came out because what McQuinney is, he taught in Alabama. I forget exactly the place where he taught. I think it was Alabama. But he's arguing that the South has a fundamental Celtic bent to it. Uh, and a lot of people didn't like that. And 1988 is when it came out. All right. mm -hmm. All right, so uh, I'll just read a couple of lines from the prologue to give you a little taste here. And I think Forrest McDonald wrote the prologue. All right, yeah. The Celtic interpretation of Southern history, to which this volume is a major contribution, can be summed up in two general propositions. One is that by virtue of historical accident, the American colonies south and west of Pennsylvania were peopled during the 17th and 18th centuries mainly by immigrants from the Celtic fringe of the British archipelago. The western and northern uplands of England, Wales, the Scottish Highlands, and borders in Ireland and that the culture these peoples brought with them and to a large extent retained in the New World accounts in considerable measure for the differences between them and the Yankees of New England, and of whom originated in the lowland southeastern half of the island of Britain. So the fundamental point of, I use that word too much, fundamental, uh, the point, the salient point <laughs> of, of this book is that the South is different in part, at least, because of a strongly Celtic background. I think that thesis still holds great weight today. But not many people have, have written about this thesis in recent years. Uh, there's another book that I want to talk about later that I don't have on the desk right now, Albion Seed by David Hackett Fisher. Uh, and he makes some similar points about folkways, the differences in folkways in the coastal regions of, of colonial America, and then the back country, the Appalachian regions, and then northern regions and so forth. So we'll talk about that book at a later time. But I hope this is of interest to you. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about the American South, I would encourage you to hang around. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of people who are making good content about understanding uh, the American South and Southern history. The history profession is certainly not doing it. The history profession now is controlled by uh, left-wing radicals who can't, who they're, they're for the most part communists, they're Marxist, and uh, they're looking at Southern history through a Marxist lens. 
that's not instructive. That doesn't tell us anything about the South. It's valuable that we can use to better understand American history and, and, and our current status. Uh, but but anyway, I'm going to draw this to a close. Was, oh, we're already at 20 minutes. I don't want to go any longer than that for the for a video. So hang around. Hang around. I'm going to continue to tell you about the South. If you're interested in it, that's great. If you have any comments that you would like to leave, I read all of them. I would like to know uh, from the audience what types of issues and topics you think uh, are important and what you would like to hear more about as we continue this little book series that we started. But in, in, until we meet again, I'm going to fire up my pipe and actually see if I can finish it. And this is Alan Harrelson. I'll catch you next time.